out in got the Alamo of World War II. For hours, days, and months, for a seemingly endless period, every man, woman, and child becomes Stalingrad's defender against furious, increasing Nazi sky and land attacks. The destruction of homes and factories is unending, but despite this avalanche of shot and shell, the heart and the will of the city's defenders never falters. Nazi dive bombers attempt to destroy a bridge, one of many erected every night but they fail utterly in every attempt to stem reinforcement. Russia and Russians are determined to hold at all costs. Perish but do not retreat is the order of every day. Here the defenders battle the invader from house to house and street to street. The undying will to resist against seemingly hopeless odds is the valiant story of Stalingrad. Every bit of cover becomes a blazing force. Ruined buildings are bombed, captured, and retaken, but the will to hold never falters. Every battered factory becomes a battleground, producing German casualties. Reinforcements arrive when Stalingrad's capture seems imminent. The tragic scene grimly symbolizes the bravery of men, women, and children who refuse to surrender. As autumn comes, hope rises again in Russia. All that Hitler could give, they've taken for a second time. And from battered Stalingrad, small patrols move forward toward the enemy. comes Russia's greatest ally, the snow and zero cold of winter on the steppe, and again the tide begins to turn. Now the Soviet armies are again on the offensive, and all the ground gained by Hitler's hordes is threatened as his armies are put to rout. On every snow-covered plain the fighting rages. A soldier goes down in the hail of enemy fire, and another casualty is taken to the rear. A scene to remember. Two Nazi supermen run for their lives. And close on their heels are the Russians moving in for their prey. Units of the great Soviet reserve armies develop an amazing pincers movement. Battling in zero weather is a job the Russians know how to do. Frozen ground, sub-zero winds, and all of the rigors of a Russian winter are endured and mastered by the Soviet fighters. Women move up under fire to give first aid to the wounded. In frigid temperatures, a casualty receives immediate treatment by these people who understand how to wage winter warfare and thus save many a Russian soldier to fight again. Exterminating Nazis is this man's specialty and he seldom misses. The soldier keeps score of his shots right in the snow beside him. And there's one more. The German armies within Stalingrad are cut off by the Russian advance. The enemy can now be supplied only by air. And here's an actual scene of a Nazi transport plane brought down, one of hundreds destroyed with all its human cargo and supplies. From strategic points on the Moscow front, from Stalingrad and from deep in the besieged oil fields of the Caucasus, a midwinter miracle is seen for the second time in Russia. The Red Army, which Hitler proudly proclaimed he had destroyed in 1941, strikes back in its greatest offensive.
Berlin films show the onslaught of Hitler's second gamble in Russia that was to be his greatest disaster. Oil stores go up in flames as the hard-pressed Russians leave only the funeral pyres of a great industrial city. The Nazi cameramen photograph only scenes that show irresistible might. The so-called Invincible Army moved in to smash all resistance before the gates of Stalingrad. Flamethrowers and grenadiers advance against the stubborn resistance of heroic defenders. And these films are to picture a great German victory. But Russia is yet to be heard from. Then comes the bitter cold of a gray dawn in November. A breath-freezing cold. This is the hour for which the Red Army has waited. Over the frozen earth, an avenging post sweeps forward to close an iron ring around the stunned German horde. Hitler hadn't promised them this. Every pocket of starved, half-frozen Nazis hidden in the rubble of Stalingrad is blasted without mercy. The swiftness of the Russian counterattack takes street after street, squeezing the enemy into a hopeless position. Twenty-two Axis divisions are caught in the great bear trap Hitler himself had planned. And then the beginning of the end. The ruins of Stalingrad disgorge a beaten army. Under the white flag, they emerge from the ruins of the city. Too callous to salute a fallen comrade, Nazi Lieutenant General von Daniel and his staff, commanding the veteran 376 Division. A beaten host that hobbles along, many of them on frostbitten feet. Lieutenant General San, who blitzed Belgium and France. But now his blitz has backfired. He is but one of 24 generals taken. Here's Lieutenant General Schlemmer, who helped conquer Holland, with his entire staff commanding the 14th Tank Corps. And Lieutenant General Moritz von Dreber, who invaded Greece. Von Daniel and his aides arrive at Soviet headquarters to be questioned, and they seem in no great hurry to face this ordeal. The Nazi salute is conspicuously absent as they play parts in a drama written by Hitler and revised by the Red Army. The biggest catch of all, Field Marshal Friedrich von Paulus and General Schmidt, his chief of staff. The Field Marshal has plenty to answer for. Von Paulus, during the siege of Stalingrad, gave orders that no prisoners were to be taken. He is questioned by his Russian captor. Berlin claims von Paulus was captured only because gravely wounded. Gravely worried might be more accurate. And here are the tattered remnants of a once proud legion that goose set for Adolf Hitler, plotting toward a Russian prison camp. From all quarters of the battered city, Axis prisoners stream in to join the parade of defeat and disaster. At last, the German invaders do march through the city of ruin and desolation but its defenders can hold their heads high. The free world salutes heroic Stalingrad.